Pastor Josh mentioned, this is the uh, Renovate series or renovation of various elements and aspects of life. And uh, the way the dates fell, I, I have been assigned the theme of biblical stewardship. And I'm actually very pleased about that because biblical stewardship is a liberating concept. It really is a very fundamental part of who we are as followers of Christ. You've heard the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You got it. That's kind of how I feel about this principle of biblical stewardship. Although I can lead you into the Word of God today, I can't force you to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's an invitation that Scripture issues and one that I would strongly encourage you to accept and receive. But friends, we all must individually submit ourselves to God's plans. We must be willing to obey and surrender, if you will, our substance and who we are in order to become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So biblical stewardship is all about this, this idea of God taking charge. Can I give you a, a definition of what biblical stewardship means? Here it is. It's the absolute surrender of ourselves and our substance to God. Now, people will say, okay, I get that. I get that. We need to be surrendered. I need to surrender to the Lord. I've heard that. I've heard all of that before. The thing I want to just point out, if I may, is that in this definition, I want you to get the absolute part. The absolute surrender. And this can become a very personal and very delicate uh, issue as we begin to embrace the principles of biblical stewardship. And it can be very delicate, especially when we get into issues relating to finances. But folks, biblical stewardship is about far more than money. Yes, it involves finances, but it's primarily about so much more. Notice, if you will, it's the absolute surrender of ourselves and our very substance. That includes everyone and everything that is nearest and dearest to us on the face of this earth. So my hope today is that you will not just be a hearer, but that you will choose to do what the Word says. Do you remember James in chapter 1, verse 22, his encouragement? Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <clears throat> You see, friends, the purpose of the proclamation of the Word of God is not just so that people can hear it. We must hear it in order to receive it. But if we simply hear it and say, yeah, I've heard that before, I've heard it, he's saying we are living in an element of deceit of ourselves. His encouragement is that we would then, by faith, act. Faith without works is dead, he will also say to us in the book of James. And so don't just hear the word. The encouragement is take a step of faith and actually do what the word says. Friends, I'm convinced that nowhere is this biblical principle more important than in the area of biblical stewardship. The invitation of scripture is to live as a follower of Jesus in complete surrender, in complete trust, and complete confidence in God, without the pressures and worries of life. When we don't live like that, when we ignore the principles of stewardship, it can actually dramatically affect our Christian experience. It can actually really downgrade the experience that the Lord of our lives wants us to have. How can we be biblical stewards of ourselves and our substance? How can we receive God's very best for life? Well, we have to move beyond just hearing the word and becoming a doer of the word. 
Because, folks, on the authority of God's Word, I have a guarantee for you. If we will do what the Word says, it will revolutionize our lives. It will revolutionize our time. It will revolutionize our resources. If we will take the Bible to heart and by faith do what it says, then we will begin to live the most exciting days as followers of Jesus Christ. God has blessings available for every one of us, but he will not release them until we submit to him and begin to obey him in absolute surrender. In Scripture, God calls himself 250 different names, many different references, but there's, there's one name that best describes him in terms of biblical stewardship, and that is the name of Master. The name of Master. How we view God determines how we live. Think about that for a moment. How we view God determines how we live. If you believe that God is a distant, detached, disinterested God who's away off in space somewhere, who isn't aware of the issues and details of life, then that is going to affect your view of life. It's going to affect the way you live. But if you believe that God is close, that he's engaged, that he's interested, that he dwells and lives within you by the power of his Holy Spirit, then that, that too will affect your view of life and will affect the way that you live. The question is, is God the master? Is he your master? Or are you your own master? Can you trust the Lord with things you cannot understand? Or do you reject it if it doesn't make sense to you? Do you really believe in God? Do you really believe that he's all-powerful? That he's all-knowing and that he is everywhere present at the same time? Do you really believe that he is your creator and sustainer and that every day has been ordained for you before one of them ever came to be? If we do, then are we living with, with him as the master? Is he in control or are we still in control? Are we living in absolute surrender? Yes, we hear the word, but are we really doing what it says? Well, what does the word say anyway? Let's have a look together this morning at this theme of biblical stewardship. Number one, God as Lord and master of the universe owns everything. He owns everything. Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1 declares, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Scripture even reveals specific items that God owns. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 23 identifies him as the owner of all the land. God says there, hey, the land is mine. In Haggai chapter 2 verse 8, the Lord says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine too, declares the Lord of hosts. In Psalm 50 verse 10, he tells us that every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. If you're a person that believes in God and has faith in his word, then you will understand that as the creator of all things, God is also the owner of this earth and all it contains. It's not ours, it's his. He has never transferred ownership 
of this earth, this world, this planet, over to us. He may have given us dominion over creation, but not ownership of it. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 tells us that at this very moment, the Lord is actually holding all things together. Everything in the world, everything in your world, everything in my world, it's all held together by the Lord's power. So recognizing that and understanding that is critical in allowing Jesus to actually be the master of our lives. This is really critical in surrendering ourselves and our substance absolutely over to God. God as Lord and master of the universe owns everything. Do you want to be a full disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? That experience begins when we accept him as Savior. But if you haven't surrendered yourself and your substance to Jesus, he's still not Lord yet. In Luke chapter 14, verse 33, Jesus himself said, Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Who is the master of your life? Are you the master? Are you in charge? Are you in control? Or is the Lord your master? The Lord's in charge. The Lord's in control. The first step toward contentment in Christian living is right here on these screens for us today. It is the recognition that God owns everything, including our lives and our substance. And if we believe that we are the owner of even one possession, then the circumstances that affect that possession will be reflected in our attitude. That's a way for us to kind of tell whether or not we think we own it or not. You know, the real estate market is through the roof. My house is worth X. I am very happy. Well, my possession, something good has happened to my possession. Okay, what happens if something bad happens to my possession? What happens if there's a decrease in this or an accident with that? All of a sudden, I'm now feeling sad because of what's happened to my possession. See, friends, this is very much an attitude for us as followers of Christ to say, Lord, it doesn't belong to me. Everything belongs to you, and I'm just using it. There's a 14-year-old Mercury Grand Marquis sitting just about there in the parking lot. And I use it every day. In fact, I've put nearly 280,000 kilometers on it. It's big. And I do a lot of highway driving, and I, I guess I like the safety factor. It's also black and looks like a police car, so I kind of get a kick out of that, too. Three weeks ago, I came out in the morning and had to be somewhere in a couple hours, and I was kind of hustling and hurrying, and just, you know, you just take your car almost for granted sometimes. And I came out and went to push the remote control to get the doors open, and the doors didn't open, and had to use the key to get into it, and the thing was absolutely stone-cold dead. I mean, deader than a doornail. What is going on with this car? I, went, I, I had to take my wife's vehicle to the appointment that I had. I came home and ended up buying a brand new battery and thought, oh, well, batteries die. I mean, these things happen. So I put another battery in the car, and everything was all right for a little while until the next morning when I came back out to start the car with the brand new battery, and the car was dead stone cold. I mean, deader than a doornail again. Nothing. There's something really wrong with my God's, excuse me, God's mercury here. 
The problem was so extensive that I ended up taking it to a, to a dealership because here's what I discovered was going on because I went out one evening with, with the garbage at about 8 o'clock at night and the car is in the driveway and the headlights are on. That's kind of spooky when the headlights are just coming on on their own. But you know, an old car, wiring problems, and it turns out I had to go to the dealership to get it fixed. Now, who wants to take a 14-year-old car to the dealership? I had my keys like this, and the man standing there with his hand out. I said, now, this car is 14 years old. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know. I said, I don't want to spend a lot of money on this car. It's 14 years old. So we had a little deal. He called me every hour as they were working their way through whatever the challenges were going to be because I needed the expertise of the dealer to figure it out. Make a long story short, three and a half hours worth of labor later and a little wiring part that had shorted out and blown underneath one of the fender covers, the car was fixed and back on the road. Now, I don't know why the Lord needed a new wiring harness on that 14-year-old that Mercury, but the thought occurred to me, you know, this isn't my car. It's God's car, and I'm just using it. It was a comforting thought to realize that God's in control of my dippy little wiring problem with my car. It's not my car. It's God's car, and I'm just using it. You ever had a car problem? That'll take the wind out of your sails, won't it? An unexpected repair bill. There are things I had planned for that money, but now it's going to go into a fill-in-the-blank repair. Friends, that's the stuff of life. Scripture's inviting us this morning to realize that it belongs to God, and we're just using it. He's the master. We are faithful servants and stewards of the Lord's resources. We're told that when John Wesley learned that his house burned to the ground, leaving him and his family homeless, that he said these words, and I quote, the Lord's house burned down. One less responsibility for me. <laughs> Friends, we can be liberated from the pressures and problems associated with the ownership of possessions. Jesus is inviting us to be his disciples. He wants to be our master, but that can't happen as long as we are the master of our own fate. Giving up ownership isn't easy. It's a stretching experience. It's a faith experience for us. And we must be constantly reminded every time we find ourselves acquiring another possession that this possession doesn't belong to me. It has come to me. I am using it for the Lord's glory. I need to be accountable to him for how I use this. I need to perhaps be willing to share this. I need to be willing to be generous with others and maybe help others. This thing, whatever it is, belongs to the Lord and I am, I am using it. This is one of the key principles of st biblical stewardship. It belongs to the Lord, not to me. It's one of the secrets to contentment that many, many Christian people have never learned because they've never let go and let God be in charge. Instead, they hold on to what they have and grasp for more worldly possessions in an effort to become wealthy. So here's the question. Is God your master? Or are you your own master? Do you believe in God and have faith in his word? Are you going to be a doer of the word? Because in his word, he says that he is the Lord and master of this universe, and he owns everything. Secondly, not only does God own everything, the second responsibility that God has retained and never transferred to us humans is ultimate control of every event that occurs on the earth. Listen to 1 Chronicles 29, 11 to 12. The Lord declares, Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. 
Can there be any doubt in our minds that God is in control? Psalm 135 verse 5 reads, The Lord does whatever pleases Him in the heavens and on the earth and in the seas and all their depths. The Lord is in control of even difficult circumstances, as He told Isaiah in chapter 45, verses 6 and 7. Listen to this, I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things on the earth, in the seas, and in their depths. Friends, it's really important that as children of God, we know and understand that God orchestrates every event in our lives. Even the sometimes devastating circumstances. And he does these things and allows these things to produce ultimate good in us. That's why Paul writes to the Roman church in chapter 8, verse 28, and he reminds them, and we know, we already know this, so it's a reminder. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. God can take anything, this thing, that thing, good thing, bad thing. He can bring it all together, and his purposes are not thwarted because of what has taken place. He's in control. He's not surprised. He's not shocked. He is in complete control. All things good, if you love God and are called according to his purpose. Do I speak to anyone this morning here at PPC that's facing a difficult circumstance? I want you to know that on the authority of God's word, he has some purpose. He has some purpose in your circumstance. I often think of Joseph in the book of Genesis and how as a young man he was taken because of the hatred of his brothers. And you may recall the story of how they took off that coat of many colors and they threw Joseph into a cistern, which was a big hole in the ground for, for uh, holding water. And they threw him into an empty cistern and they killed a little animal and dipped his coat in the blood and went back and told his father their father, that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. Joseph is sold off into slavery, into Egypt. They didn't do it for his good. They didn't do it to help him out. They didn't do it to be nice. They do it because they hated him. And Joseph was looking up at the blue sky. Can you just imagine that circle of blue as he looked up out of the cistern, looking up to the stars, up to heaven, up to God. Lord, what is this? What is this experience? You've put dreams in my heart, and here I am now being sold into slavery in Egypt. Well, Joseph, as a much older and wiser man, looks back, and when he confronts his brothers many years later, he's able to say, so then, it was not you who sent me here to Egypt, but it was God. God did it. God allowed it. God had a higher purpose to save all of Joseph's family from starvation, to uh, establish the, the children of Israel, the Hebrew people, and that culture, that community would eventually produce a savior for the world. Oh, God had a plan behind Joseph's experience. Can you accept that God has a plan, my friend, a purpose behind your difficult situation? Perhaps he's developing something in you. Perhaps he's developing you in some special way. Perhaps it's a, a development of, of character or a stretching in your faith. He wants you to come through this time of trial with a greater capacity to trust in him. A.W. Tozer once said, God can't use a person to the maximum until they've been hurt deeply. I don't know if you've got any scars. I have a few physically on my body. They don't hurt anymore. But they're a reminder to me of an experience that was painful. Perhaps we can relate to others far better because of some of the pain we have felt. 
And perhaps your tough circumstance today is about helping you to become a person more mature and useful to him. God does teach us his best lessons during our toughest times. Have you found that to be true? We really do learn significant lessons in times of difficulty, don't we? Are you in a tough circumstance today? Please don't conclude that the Lord is disinterested or disconnected. The Bible says that God is in control of everything that happens on the earth. And it also says that as his children, we can be confident that all things work together for good. Maybe there's a lesson, a purpose in the pain. The third reality, and one that we need to accept and realize, is that tough circumstances can sometimes be God's discipline. The Lord does discipline us, doesn't he? Even if we're being disciplined, we can still be confident that he loves us. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that those the Lord loves, he disciplines. It's because he loves us that he disciplines us. If he didn't love us and didn't care, there'd be no need for discipline. There'd be no restoration of our experience. Here's what Hebrews 12 says. God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So I consider, I invite you to think about this and consider with me this morning the truth from Scripture that God not only owns everything in this world, but he is also in control of everything that happens in this world including every circumstance that you and I will ever face. We can be confident as children of God that in every situation that he allows, there is ultimate purpose. That is, if we're submitted to him as master. Everybody okay out there? It's awfully quiet. Here's the third thing Scripture says about biblical stewardship. God promises, he promises to provide our needs. He owns everything, he's in control of everything, and he promises you and me that he will provide everything we need. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus is speaking to the people on the hillside in, in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What things? What things is he talking about? There's three things in that chapter that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about food in their stomachs, clothes on their backs, and roofs over their heads. All these things will be added to you if you just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus essentially says, stop worrying about food. Stop worrying about clothing. Stop worrying about shelter. You're wasting your life worrying about basic things that God promises to give to you. If you'd only put God first... Friend, do you believe in God? Do you have faith in his word? Then why spend so much time worrying about the issues of life that God has promised to look after? Jesus said, do you see the little flowers of the field and the birds of the air? Your heavenly Father can look after all of them. How much more important are you? as his children. And why can't you accept that God will provide every need? The invitation, folks, is that we be worshipers of our Heavenly Father, not worriers about this life. The invitation is that we worship. The reality is we often worry. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let God handle paying all the bills. Now that's a paraphrase. But that's the invitation that Jesus is issuing. His name is, according to Genesis chapter 22 verse 14, his name is Jehovah Jireh. And Jehovah Jireh means the Lord 
will provide. The Lord will provide. His name is not the Lord can provide. His name is not the Lord might provide. His name is not the Lord did provide once upon a time. His name is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And he doesn't need a prosperous economy to do it. It doesn't matter if we're in a recession. It doesn't matter if the TSX and the Dow Jones are in record territory. It doesn't matter what the interest rates are. It doesn't matter who the President of the United States is. He fed millions of people in the wilderness over a period of 40 years with manna every day. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves and two fish. What does God care about the world's economy, friends? We're children of the King. Our passports are stamped with heaven. We are God's children. On the authority of God's word, I declare to you that the Lord is absolutely dependable when it comes to fulfilling this promise in our lives. God will provide. Can you say amen to that today? He will. He may be very creative. I've discovered sometimes I have more income or revenue to help. Sometimes I have less expenses. I found that sometimes I might receive an unexpected gift. I found sometimes something lasts way longer than it ever should have. I found that a limited resource can sometimes be stretched. But friends, let's delight in giving the Lord of the universe the credit for these things. Let's give him the credit and say, Lord, thank you for that working out the way it did. Increased income, reduced expenses, something lasting longer, somebody providing a blessing, something coming out of left field. It's not just a circumstance that just happened randomly. Oh, no, 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 no. We are children of the Most High. God has a way of demonstrating his lordship to us on a daily basis, if we're paying attention, and if we will give him the credit. The Lord is true to his word, friends. His name is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. As we close, are you content? Are you at peace? Is there encouragement in your heart? Who's the master? Who's in charge? Who's in control? The Bible says God owns everything. The Bible says he's in control of everything. The Bible says that he will provide everything we need. So will you be a worshiper or will you be a worrier? Will you just hear the word or will you be a doer of the word? Here's one thing we all need to do if we're going to be doers of the word in this area of biblical stewardship. We must all do this. You may have done it before, but again this morning I'm gonna ask you to do it again or it might be the very first time you've ever done this. In terms of biblical stewardship, this morning we are all going to submit our resignations as general managers of our own lives and relinquish control and ownership of everything over to the Lord. He is master. We want to be found good and faithful servants, stewards of God's resources. Friends, it's a powerful combination that will really change your Christian experience. Wendy and I have three children and our youngest is Emily. She just turned 21 earlier this month. But in my thoughts and in my heart, she's still three years old. Parents, you get that? Where did the years go? I remember back when she was about three, sitting at the kitchen table, and we had brought home a pizza 
which was kind of always fun for us to have pizza night. And it was just a cheese pizza because that's all the kids would eat. I was looking for, you know, the meat lovers special. But anyway, it was just cheese pizza. So she's sitting there in her little seat, and we're all sitting around the table, and she's got this piece of cheese pizza, and she's taking these bites out of it and chewing, just kind of minding her own business. So I looked at her, and I said, Emily, can I have that piece of pizza? And she just uh, took another bite and just stared at me and just chewed, just looking at me. Three years old. I said, did, did you hear what I said? I, I wondered if I could have that piece of pizza. Can I, ha can I have a bite? She just keeps biting her pizza, putting it down, just chewing and staring at it, wiggle her nose, just, just ignoring me. I asked her a third time, Emily, I would like that piece of pizza. The kid takes another bite, puts it down, and just keeps chewing, staring at me like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I asked her one more time, Emily, could I, could I have your pizza? She looks at me and with full confidence, she says, when I'm done, you can have the crust. <laughs> See, what Emily didn't understand is I bought the pizza. <laughs> I brought it home. If I'd wanted to, I could have had 100 pizzas in the house that night. I could have had pizza piled up all over the place. It's not like I didn't have access or resources to have pizza. That wasn't the point. The point was I wanted to know if she had it in her little pink heart to give me her piece of pizza. That's what I wanted to know, is if, if she loved me enough to give me her piece of pizza. Apparently, she didn't. <laughs> now, folks, we never act like that. I know we don't. But I want you to think about it for a moment, that the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, has given us possessions. And there are times when he may ask us for that back. He may want to redeploy. He may want to reorganize. He may want to rearrange. He may want to remove something to provide us with something else. Biblical stewardship says, okay, I'm going to take this possession and instead of holding on to it and grasping at it, I hold it like this in an open hand. It's in my possession. It belongs to the Lord, but I'm using it. And if the Lord comes along and says, I would like that piece of pizza or that fill-in-the-blank possession or he wants that resource, then it belongs to him anyway. Biblical stewards say, Lord, I'm comfortable with that. I've done my best with it as long as it was in my care, and I now surrender it to you. So, Lord, there it is. It belongs to you. I was using it. It's yours. Friends, if we live our lives with that kind of open-handed faith, we will discover that there is contentment, there is peace, and here's the deal. As you generously, graciously use things in your possession to bless other people and for kingdom purpose, God will trust you with more. God has a way of redeploying resources. When we demonstrate that we're trustworthy as servants and stewards, think about that parable of the talents. Five talents, two talents, one talent, and the, the servants that demonstrated to the master that they could handle it received even more. The guy that took his one talent and buried it in the ground demonstrated that he couldn't even be trusted with that much. And that servant was cast out, his talent was taken, and given to who? The one who had ten talents, because God said, I can trust you with this. I'm going to give you an eleventh talent to manage for me. Friends, this is all about attitude. It's all about perspective. And how we feel about it doesn't change the fact that God already owns it anyway. And he's already in control of everything anyway. And his promises to provide for us, that's not changing either. It's about us coming into alignment with God's plan, God's purposes, and seeing Jesus not just as Savior for the day I die and go to heaven, but as Lord of my life. And that I can live every day in peace, happiness, and contentment in partnership with a good God who loves me and who promises to supply every need. Amen.